Excellent. Well, thanks for everybody for making it to the seminar. Um, quick thank you out to Finance Magnates for sponsoring another great London conference and creating the opportunity for us to get together as an industry and talk about what's hot. Today, uh, I'll be speaking about the evolution of retail FX connectivity. And when I say connectivity, um, there's a lot of different connection points that happen in, within the, the retail FX space. What I'm specifically talking about is the real-time flow of trade quotes and settlement. Uh, I'm going to avoid, for the purpose of time and simplicity, talking about post-trade transactions, CLS, clearing, give-ups, Triana. It's a different side of the industry. Today, what I, what I really want to look at is, from the perspective of a retail broker and a prime broker who is catering to liquidity designed for the retail space, what components existed as this industry came up over the last 10 years? What components have evolved to cater to needs of, of different brokers and prime brokers? And, and what do we see from 1.0's perspective and from my perspective in the industry as the future of connectivity within the retail space? So I think we're all aware over the past decade, the retail FX space has grown considerably. Um, the BIS volume survey is one of the favorite things for FX market participants to pass around to venture capitalists or, or people looking to invest in their business. Um, and as a result, the industry has gained a tremendous amount of attention from technology providers looking to come in and get a piece of the transactional pie that exists within the retail FX market space. Um, I think one thing that's very interesting to note is even though we're 10 years, 15 years to some into the evolution of this space, there are still startup brokers. There are still new shops coming out of China, uh, the Far East, and, and, and even in some more mature districts like the UK and, and ASIC, um, you're still seeing brokers start up. Um, they have vastly different challenges than a broker who has been in the industry for a few years and has matured and grown out of either a startup phase or a proprietary phase into what I'd consider an adolescence or an institutional adolescence for a retail broker. So one thing that I like to do when I, when I talk about the FX connectivity landscape is first talk about what a more traditional financial exchange looks like. And, and I think that's a key way to highlight what the challenges that we face in the retail space are. In a traditional exchange model, you have a centralized point of the two main things that I talked about for connectivity. Sourcing quotes, trades, and clearing all happen at one centralized location. So the points at which you connect in and actually route this information is relatively standardized. The fragmentation that you see in a traditional exchange landscape, and I'm talking about equities exchanges, futures exchanges, tend to come more on the front end side. You see a lot more variety in how you're accessing these markets from a retail standpoint, from an actual client facing standpoint. But the actual connectivity in terms of routing is quite standardized because it's forced and normalized through one central point. Now in retail FX, I think we all know this is a little bit more complicated. The market does have a top down derived approach of how liquidity or, or rates or access to an indicative rate of what the market is at generally starts at the bank or non-bank level at the top of the value chain here. Now what's interesting is that liquidity and, and, and the dissemination of actual market data is actually completely decoupled from the clearing side of the business. Even though this bank up top may be deriving the actual rate, looking at macroeconomics, doing whatever a bank does to determine what is the spot euro dollar price today, the clearing of that trade can actually occur down at the retail broker level. Depending on regulatory jurisdiction, depending on how they've structured their business, you can clear trades at any point in this topology, and you have quite a complex landscape of where the liquidity can actually come from. Um, so speaking back to the technology solutions that have addressed some of this complexity in the market, I, I think we're all pretty well aware of the terms aggregator, ECN. Um, those technologies have primarily been developed to address the fragmentation of liquidity uh, at the top end of the market. We have the bridge and order management system segment, which is catering to brokers and prime brokers passing clearing between each other, allowing smaller retail brokers to move up the value chain to access liquidity from these larger entities. And at the end, we have the retail brokers, similar to the equities market, using front ends to access their clients directly. 
just a brief talk about what is aggregation. Um, for those of you in the room, it, it, it's not necessarily a term that has a succinct definition. I don't necessarily think my definitions are 100% are correct, but for the purpose of the presentation, I see an aggregation as a portal for combining multiple sources of liquidity. Uh, it allows brokers to leverage the fact that there are multiple sources from which you can access liquidity within the FX space. There are no aggregators, generally speaking, in, in, a, in a futures market because there's one central point of that data and thus there's nothing necessarily to aggregate. The challenge of aggregation as we've seen it in this space, um, and especially to retail brokers, is that though they can get liquidity from multiple sources and blend it together into one feed. We talked about how trades can actually clear at multiple sources. And unless a broker has access to true prime brokerage, the ability to centralize their risk after execution, after they've sourced the liquidity, the value of aggregation erodes very quickly. And, and this is specifically a concern for retail brokers. Um, many of the aggregators out there, the traditional firms like CurrentX, Integral, um, have struggled, EBS is another example. The value proposition from them to a retail broker is limited. Without a centralized give up, without the ability for them to take these executions that occur at multiple liquidity providers that they're blending into one feed and blend it into one clearing account, the value proposition of an aggregator is, is quite limited. Uh, the other challenge that I think is, is much more evident um, as a result of SMB is credit. It's not very valuable to have an aggregation where you're selling liquidity downstream if you don't have the credit, if you don't have the balance sheet to pass that liquidity down. And thus, aggregation technology has um, played an important role in the space and will continue to, um, but has challenges in today's model. Before I jump into bridging, one thing I think deserves clarification and oftentimes gets confused is the difference between aggregation, ECN, and exchange. Um, these terms are often thrown around. Some providers call themselves both an ECN and an aggregator. Um, you have firms like LMAX who very clearly define themselves as an exchange. Uh, in my opinion, you, you can differentiate, differentiate these three things very clearly if you look at how the clearing occurs and who controls what liquidity is actually being aggregated. So if we're talking about an aggregation engine, a technology solution, this is a piece of software that allows you to take multiple liquidity providers and build a pool. Construct one yourself custom to the clearing entity that's licensing or using that aggregator. The difference between an aggregation and an ECN, in my opinion, is that an ECN is generally owned by a technology entity. It's a predefined pool of liquidity providers that can be accessed and cleared externally. Clearing providers can participate in an ECN and take liquidity from it, and at times the actual liquidity pool is flexible. It's very difficult for a clearing provider to come to an ECN and force liquidity into it, or force a new maker into it. But when you build pools or stream to clients out of an ECN, you generally have the ability to pick and choose what LPs in that ECN participate in your stream. And lastly, you have an exchange. An exchange, as kind of the completion of, of the evolution here, is a very rigidly defined model. The makers are very defined. The clearing is very rigid. You're cleared in the exchange only. It's FX working like the traditional futures or equities markets we talked about at the start of the presentation. One important thing to note between these three things too from a technology perspective is that very rarely do aggregators have the concept of a matching engine. The downstream entities that you pass liquidity from an aggregator generally do not get to aggress or take within that pool, or sorry, and make back into that pool. Some ECNs, example like CurrentX's anonymous pool, do have the ability to take liquidity in from outside sources, people participating as a taker, and exchanges, it's kind of the basis of the model to add taker liquidity to the book. So I think these are three important definitions in understanding the ev evolution of the institutional side of the space. Now let's talk a little bit more about retail. Bridge technology, um, it's a term I think everybody that exists in the retail space is familiar with. Um, I think an interesting thing to note is that whatever industry you're in, um, in the fintech space, be it, it equities, futures exchange, um, even if you're a payment provider, me and Brian were just talking about Venmo, bridges exist in all of these cases. Um, generally speaking, a bridge is something 
that is used as a gateway, a, a simple abstraction layer to connect one platform, one front end to an external source of liquidity. And it's generally actually a pretty simple thing to do that's internalized by firms and other industries. Why is the concept of a, a bridge so ubiquitous and, and, and such a common term in the FX space? I, I think that comes down solely to the success of MetaTrader 4. Um, the firms that came out early in the evolution of MetaTrader developed viable technology that filled a gap that that platform did not have and still has not filled, created a marketplace for a third-party bridge, an off-the-shelf off the solution for this platform, rather than just it being another small cog in the overall topology and, and technology stack that you'd build out at a broker. Um, for, MT, for MT4 itself, it's generally understood you need a bridge. For other platforms, um, you're starting to see platforms come out with a bridge built in. This is a, a piece of functionality, a key value proposition that a lot of the newer platforms entering the market have um, included with their stuff. So I, I think the question on everybody's mind is, why are me and Tom still around? <laughs> MetaTrader is part of that. Um, but I think there's more to it. I think if we're being fair to a small number of the bridge providers that exist in this space, we have to look at more of what's happened for bridge providers. The ubiquity of MetaTrader, the growth of that platform and the success of that platform, and the global distribution. We estimate there's maybe 2,000 MetaTrader licenses, thousands of brokers out there who are running MetaTrader. And their needs, from a perspective of not just access to liquidity, but monitoring, configuration, trade reporting, a lot of the things that you'd see coming out of a traditional institutional grade technology, out of an aggregator. Things like post-trade reporting, regulatory reporting, access to multiple different front ends rather than just a MetaTrader server from one central point, and also access to multiple liquidity providers. So, over the last two to three years, I, I think, though the industry has con continued to refer to some of these legacy firms as bridge providers, I think it's very clear and, and understood that some of these providers have transcended that, that role. Now, are they fully fledged aggregators? Or are, are there GoldEye and 1.0 solutions sitting in the, in the back end of Citadel running their um, liquidity discovery process? No, not necessarily. The, the, the role of the aggregator in the institutional side of the space remains the same, but the growth in this industry, when we're talking specifically about retail FX, has driven a new technology component that I refer to as the hub. Um, and it, it, it's more centered around the needs of the retail broker that are not catered to from MetaTrader outside of just liquidity sourcing. So the last component in my legacy technology stack, aggregation, bridge. Now let's talk about front end. Um, a term that's used for MetaTrader 4 is it's often called a platform. And in the technology world, that's actually a correct association. MetaTrader 4 is a platform because it's not just a front end. It's not just a GUI. And despite gripes that, that, that may come about how and why and when they made certain decisions in developing these things, MetaTrader 4 has a built-in GUI, a built-in risk management system, and a built-in back office. This space here represents what I think a retail broker needs in order to offer a technology stack out to clients. We know that the bridge or hub space has filled the liquidity box, but many brokers out there in the retail space, for as long as they've existed, have relied on MetaTrader for its GUI, risk management, and back office. And an interesting thing, I think, is that a lot of the competitors that have come out to MetaTrader, platforms like CTrader, have actually duplicated this model. They haven't looked to just build a completely viable front end, GUI, uh, something that challenges MetaTrader's ubiquity in terms of client access, but they've also built in their own back office and risk management, which I actually think is a negative. Um, from my perspective, I see the future of front ends as what I call thin clients um, or mobile clients. And these type of trading platforms, moving away from MetaTrader, lack things like risk management and back office but have a much more defined role. Their retail client access, their front end access, 
and they rely on further components up the topology in order to gain risk management and back office. And the reason I think that is because the trend for brokers, the trend for clients, is to want to offer multiple front ends. And if front ends keep coming out, if, if, if the end user access keeps being coupled with a risk management and back office solution, what you end up with is brokers who have not only three different ways to access their liquidity, but three different places where risk management needs to occur within their brokerage, three different back office systems where their client information is stored and their ledger exists, and a, a, a very disjointed, very fragmented, even within the technology topology, build out of how these four key components are managed. So just, just to give a very basic example of, of where we've come to today. Um, this is just, in my opinion, over the last six years. You're a MetaTrader broker. You started out. You bought a MetaTrader platform. You're, you're, you're sitting pretty. You got GUI, risk, and back office right out of the box. Uh, you know you need liquidity. So you call Tom. You call Andrew. You get a bridge and connect to your LP. Pretty standard setup. People know how this works. It's tried and true. You choose the right provider. You have a viable solution here. Your broker grows to doing about 10 yards a month, and you realize, ooh, Time for another MetaTrader. Now, the boxes here are, are, are not just copy-paste. They're indicative that there is actually a separate risk management and back office system in this second instance of MetaTrader. It's not a clustered platform. It doesn't have a centralization of your positions, of your client data. You're actually having now two sources that you have to go to to manage your risk and view your positions and manage your clients. Um, fortunately, as we noted, the liquidity hubs have come out. You know, the, 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 the providers who were building viable bridge, bridge solutions that were uh, architected, performant, and stable enough for a broker to grow to 10 yards have seen clients who have grown to two, three, four, eight meta traders. And the technology from the point of sourcing liquidity has kept up with that. This model exists out today. I think the liquidity hub and the work that's been done by the retail-facing technology providers has been fantastic in facilitating multiple MetaTrader environments. Now let's say you add a C trader, or you can add another LP too with your hub. Let's add a C trader in there. Now, C trader has its own GUI, its own risk, and its own back office. And now all of those components sit in a third place. You're managing your liquidity. You can still connect it into the hub. But now you're struggling and your dealers are managing risk in multiple different places. And, and this is the position that so many retail brokers find themselves in today. Um, fortunately, there are solutions for this too. Uh, One Zero launching the Tapas solution today, um, a centralized means of risk managing at the hub level. Uh, GoldEye launched a product last year that allowed similar things. You see products like Centroid. Um, this, this challenge is being addressed. So, we can safely say that because the trade flow is moving up and down through um, these retail platforms, the hub has centralized that management. There are risk management options to centralize your risk management as a retail broker. You, you've, you've gotten 50% of the way there, eliminating this risk component in each of your trading platforms. And now you're sitting in a situation where your GUI and your back office are stuck down at the bottom of your hierarchy. So what happens when you go to bring on the hottest new mobile trading app that, that now retail clients are pushing for? Well, it looks like this. It's its own box. It has front end access. It could plug into your liquidity hub. It could give you rates. You could trade through it. But you've taken for granted the fact that margin, back office, and client management has all been done in your front ends up until this point. And I think this challenge is what is going to define the next evolution of connectivity in the retail space. Retail brokers are not ready for FSS. They're not ready for 2-4. They don't have necessarily a familiarity with trade give up, settlement. They don't even want to know what a forward is, let alone purchase a back office system that caters to that type of trade clearing. Basically, what they want is a solution where their back office and credit management can move upstream and be centralized across multiple front ends. The liquidity hub, in my opinion, will evolve into a credit hub. Uh, the ability for 
retail brokers to take the things that they like about MetaTrader. And people, this has been a marketing pitch for years for, for, for companies that have relied on MetaTrader but seen some of these challenges um, coming from a mile away. How do we, brokers come and they say, we want MetaTrader to just be a front end. We want to plug it into our proprietary back office. And, and there are challenges there around catering to how trades are settled, how P&L is done, but it, it's a challenge that is yet to be addressed by an off-the-shelf solution. So I see major trends that are influencing this next generation move. So coming from our first picture to here, not a tremendous amount has changed over the last five years, say. Um, bridges still exist. There's 26 companies out there by our last count that offer a bridge. Um, there's a handful of them that are actually viable solutions, and the industry is aware of this from a liquidity perspective. Those bridge providers that have evolved have, have built out hub models. Uh, the ability to source liquidity from multiple providers, do creative reporting, to, to grow up as a retail broker away from relying on your front end only for things like credit, back office reporting, uh, regulatory reporting. The maturity cycle of these brokers is getting to the point that they want to offer things more than front end platforms with built in risk management and back office. They want to offer new GUIs that are not attached to a margin engine or a back office system. They want to offer fixed APIs to their clients. A lot of MetaTrader brokers out there, especially ones that have evolved to do 50, 60, 70, 80 yards a month on a fully retail platform, now have the balance sheet, now have the access to liquidity, and potentially the credit to start offering API business, drawing lines between each other in this topology rather than having to go through a prime broker. The equation sounds great, it all adds up. They have the volume, they have the relationships, they have the balance sheet to do it. When they go to step into that avenue, they realize, where's my pre-trade risk? Where, where am I going to manage these API clients, these new trading platforms that I'm looking to bring on? Because for my entire life, I've re relied on MetaTrader to do that. The other challenge that has come up is, is not just for retail brokers. Um, prime brokers, and, and even some banks. Um, I, as far as I'm aware, on the, on the standard EBS setup that exists right now between banks, there is still the ability to get an ACK on a trade and then a reject following that ACK due to margin. You go downstream a little bit, you look at some of the legacy aggregation providers, you look at some of the back offices that prime brokers are running, they tend to be decoupled. They tend to be a separate post-trade back office system where margin is maintained, but not pre-trade, which your compliance department was fine on prior to January 15th, prior to realizing that pre-trade risk on a cash basis is going to be the name of the game to protect yourself moving forward. So not only do retail brokers who have relied on MetaTrader in a front end to do their credit and pre-trade risk management have a challenge in evolving themselves, Guys that are sitting in the prime of prime and prime brokerage space are also looking at their risk management solutions and saying, well, how do I get pre-trade risk where my back office sits over here? Their concept of real time is you know, one to two seconds to pick up a drop copy and book the trade to the client's account. And sure, I'll get an email when the client blows through their margin, but that email doesn't help if Swissy just moved 20% and he's in debit. So throughout the whole industry, you have a demand for a more complex pre-trade risk solution. Coupling the concept that traditionally sat in a back office with the connectivity that exists on a trade-by-trade -trade basis and delivering a solution that in line with those same components that we've relied on for liquidity dissemination and execution, well, we now need risk to be in line with that or, or else we're not going to be able to execute the trade and we're definitely not going to be able to do it in the sub one millisecond time frame that's put a lot of demands on these execution technologies. So what's happening? Two things. The bridge providers who have evolved into hubs are pushing themselves up into the aggregation space. And again, this isn't necessarily about building the 50 maker pool that was the, all the rage back in 2009 the more liquidity you can get, the better, and that, that's why I wanted an aggregator. These components are pushing upstream 
because the institutional demand for some concepts that traditionally were considered retail, cash margin. In the same way, these aggregation players are also pushing downstream. They're saying, why do these bridge providers even need to exist? Where's my value proposition to retail brokers? Uh, I, I've saturated the institutional market. I've saturated the prime brokerage market. Uh, we've gone to regional banks and are, are swimming our way around regional banks. I, I, I as an aggregator, I as a, I as a manager of, of one of these legacy firms would be saying, okay, how do I get more access to retail? How do I get my hands in the pot that these bridge providers have created as a result, again, of the success of MetaTrader and the need for that connectivity? Um, so who has an answer? Some of the traditional aggregation venues uh, do have a cash margin solution. Um, but they lack the connectivity into the retail platforms that they want to access, that they want to margin out to. Some of the evolving bridge providers are, are, are getting there on competitive institutional technology. We're not doing swaps and forwards and, and, and some of the things that you saw balloon out in a horizontal standpoint from these platforms, but you're seeing viable cases where the providers that were traditionally seen as very retail, very attached to MetaTrader, are out there in situations where we don't even touch MetaTrader platforms, where we're servicing prime brokers, using concepts that came out of the retail industry, dealing with things that we've dealt with in the retail industry for years, massive micro-lot ticket flows, pre-trade risk, um, and we're doing so with the connectivity that we already brought in from these retail platforms. So, I wrote an article about this a couple months ago, but reviewing it here I think is important in, in understanding where this evolution is not necessarily going to come top down. If you look at an average software technology cycle, the platforms that entered the FX space at an institutional standpoint, the aggregators who dominated that area of the market for years, are here. And I don't think they, they would argue this. In terms of the evolution of their code base, they have reached a point where the integral here, funny term, the area underneath the curve here <laughs> is reflective of the maintenance cost to continue to change your software. The rough analogy is steering an aircraft carrier. As your technology platform becomes more complex, the changing of one little thing, let's add CFDs, Let's be able to margin pre-trade per currency. Changing one thing sinks the whole ship. You get to the point where your options are rewrite the whole thing or try to cram it into the existing technology at a detriment of testing and development costs. And, and I think anybody who's dealt with these firms who's existing in the prime brokerage space and still dealing with one of these legacy aggregators goes through that struggle on a daily basis. It works great unless I need to do something different, unless I need CFDs in there to be competitive, unless I need from my compliance to now margin per currency. So if you take the retail providers, those that have constructed their technologies well, we're sitting more in the growth, bordering on maturity phase. Six years for a software development pro uh, product is a long time. But those that have been architected well still have some ramp up, still have some curve to be able to adapt in a way that can actually address these new demands that have come out in the market. Legacy aggregators are also facing pricing pressure. And at the end of the day, in a value chain, again, where we just need to accept that MetaTrader is a necessary evil. It, it's there, it's going to be the platform that needs to be in place at every single retail broker. If you're solution for risk management, for liquidity sourcing, for credit, does not have direct connectivity into MetaTrader, that's great for us because you need to put a bridge in place. And there's a defined cost structure for that. And it attacks your value proposition, having multiple technology costs within your stack in order to do that. The last two things I think that, that really pressure the aggregators now come back to SMB. Less participants in this marketplace are getting direct prime brokerage. Therefore, less participants are able to truly benefit from the value of aggregation. Nobody, nobody's going out and, and picking up a city PB at, at a buck a million clearing cost right now and just going and getting a bunch of banks and building a competitive stream. That stream's coming from relationships. That stream's coming from a smaller base of uh, individually driven liquidity sources and not from a lot of the things that these technologies were built out to do originally. 
So the challenge to what I'd call the hub providers, the, 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 the technology providers who have grown up in the retail space who want to continue to address these challenges within the retail top to bottom topology is we need to not only expand and continue to handle more front ends, we need to not only adapt to some of the more institutional functionality that, that's very clearly been attacked by these products already, reporting and such, we need to start looking at how we can take the centralization concept that we've learned to use in the liquidity side of things and do it on the credit side of things. And, and the race is, going back to our graph there, is the amount of development necessary at our penalty to put in credit, to put in the right institutional functionalities to cater to this space, going to be more than the amount that they have to put in to access retail directly. And, and, and I think a lot of people have seen over the last three to five years that building out to MetaTrader is actually difficult. It, it, it is actually a real challenge that creates a necessary evil where if you don't have it, you're going to need to go to one of the few providers who can actually do it. And thus, your value proposition from a brokerage standpoint is eroded. So the answer that, that, that I have, I guess, at the end of this is, is a number of other questions. I, I, I do think that we need to look to these providers, to providers like One Zero, look for options for moving credit, moving the concept of pre-trade risk management into not just liquidity hubs, but credit hubs. The ability to have a reliable component that exists on a pre-trade basis that can be put in front of a legacy aggregator, that can be put in front of a retail platform or behind a retail platform, that has the scale to handle some of the things that MetaTrader has done so well, but because of its, uh, its position in the topology is very limiting to rest at that level. So if I'm a retail broker, and, and, and I just sat through this presentation, it, the questions I'd be asking myself, whether I'm starting up or, or I've existed for 10 years, you know, how reliant am I on a single front end and trading platform? It, there are, frankly, some people out there who MetaTrader is it, and, that, and, and take advantage of the fact that there are technology solutions out there. If you're willing to maintain just MetaTraders or platforms with credit built into them, you're probably in good shape. Uh, the solutions that have come from the hub providers are great for you. How reliant am I on a single LP or a smaller pool of LPs? Do, just because I've grown up and my balance sheet has increased, is it necessary for me to go through the process of getting tier one prime brokerage, or is there quality liquidity targeted at retail that's available for me today? Do I have a balance sheet that takes advantage of this? Do, can I actually get that prime brokerage? Do I ever want to sell liquidity to other brokerages? If I don't, if, if, if my marketing, my value proposition, my risk team, my structure is based on being a retail broker, then you will get away with the topology that exists today. If you want to grow as a retail broker beyond just being an access to retail clients through a handful of front ends with, with built-in risk management technology and credit, you'll be okay. If you want to sell liquidity to other brokers, you need to be pressuring providers, you need to be looking for credit solutions that are going to address the compliance risks that exist in, in today's market. And the last slide is decision point for prime brokers. I, I, I don't think this is a retail only problem. I don't think this presentation was for retail brokers only because the value in accessing new liquidity markets, in getting new clients, in bringing on new flow for a prime broker is still very reliant on retail. It's, it's where the growth is happening in this industry. And so as a prime broker, I'd be asking, will I be able to maintain my current position in the value chain? Um, probably by now you know that. Um, some people, for some, the dust is still settling. Will I maintain my tier one PB? If not, what does my liquidity sourcing option look like? What does my technology solution, even if I have maintained my PB, look like? Will my post-SMB compliance department allow me to continue to run in a model where I give out liquidity through a fixed API, put an NOP restriction on it, because that's what my technology does, and post-trade it into a back office and cross my fingers that the market doesn't move faster than that back office notifies me that a client's in debit? 
I'd be asking as a prime broker if my legacy aggregation provider gets me direct access to retail, or if I should be looking for a solution, maybe specifically targeted to retail, that collapses that value proposition and in one brokerage fee can handle direct access to retail platforms as well as the institutional functionality that I need to run my business and handle my compliance. And last question, do I need to alter my model to maintain my margins? Am I still viable? Did my cost of credit go up? Does my technology stack just not work in a way that when I plug in that extra component to reach the clients that I want to reach, do I still make money? Or was I running on such a thin model that it doesn't work for me anymore? So I, I look forward to being out there as a technology provider, answering some of these questions for you guys. I think it's a very challenging thing that the industry is facing that, that we're up against in ways that some people realize and, and that some do not. And I hope everybody got something out of the presentation today. Thank you, Andrew. You guys have any questions? Thank you. Very interesting. And the question I have is, how do you see the real challenges of a retail broker? Because this is very interesting, but I think it's the past. It's finished. Retail brokers, you have two types, global, and they're fine, and all the others, which is 90% of the people. And if they don't change their model, they're dead in the water within two years. The capital requirements from have, for having a direct prime brokerage relationship in 18 months would be 100 million plus. Any, anybody that doesn't turn over a few billions a day, not interested. I used to run a prime brokerage globally and retail business, I hated it. And all my colleagues hate it. Why? You get killed on CLS fees. And you don't want this one. You want other people to take care of it. So all this is nice and good, but the net result is that a domestic retail broker, and you take anyone in uh, uh, continental Europe, for example, will never have enough business and enough credibility to have a direct credit relationship with a prime broker. We'll have to go through a prime of prime. Prime of Prime don't have the balance sheet in general to support this type of business. And the only reason they offer Prime of Prime is to attract direct liquidity. So to me, the future of a retail platform is, yes, to have all the technology with which you connect to your clients, but basically to have behind you an institutional broker as your only source of liquidity that offers you best execution at a cost, but that cost will be much less than a prime of prime. Don't forget that prime of prime relies on a prime broker behind. Prime of prime fees in two years time will be $20 per million, not five. PB fees will be seven, $8 per million for the other people. So there is no uh, scope to have uh, this type of cost paid for unless spread widens, widens significantly. So the only way to stay in business for a, a domestic or a regional retail broker uh, is to have one liquidity provider that already aggregates institutional liquidity and shows it to you, who can aggregate massive volumes behind and give it to a prime broker, and that prime broker is happy to deal with bigger tickets, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I, I agree with you across the board. I think you made two assumptions that, that, that are a little different in the retail space. One. Your assumption is that every retail broker is an STP broker. That's not true. Going back to the first slide, these retail brokers can clear their own trades if they want to. That still doesn't mean that they have a credit solution to go out and sell omnibus risk. This isn't the venue to, to talk about whether or not they have the sophistication to actually take on that risk. The, the other question I'd have back to you is I agree that there's, it's easy to look at a very fragmented industry like FX, and you don't have to be a rocket scientist to say this industry is ripe for consolidation. But catalysts to consolidation do occur, and SMB was one of those. And, and so it is very interesting how that's happening, and I do see consolidation happening more in the prime or prime space than the retail space. If your assumption is that there will be four global retail brokers, I could probably name them, and, and they, they have an internal solution to that, uh, to, to credit and, and back office, and, and, and they built out a prop platform before they brought on Meta. What's interesting, and, and we can talk about them since they don't exist anymore, had, a, had Alpari not 
disappeared as a result of SMB. Um, I think a lot of people would have named them as one of the global players who participate in the, the scale of the industry competing with FXCM, Oanda, Saxo. And Alpari was a MetaTrader only shop. They, they grew up in MetaTrader. They had a, a thousand of them. And, and there are other firms out there. There are other firms that are doing 80, 100, even more yards a month of business that have a decent balance sheet that literally rely on MetaTrader as their sole point of credit management still today. So I, I, I do agree that consolidation is going to compact the prime brokerage space. I think there are a lot of people who won't be around in three to five years as a result of that. I still think that the, the opportunity that MetaTrader has created for these startup brokers that have transcended the jungle, the, the bucket shop area, and grown to be a, a, a large enterprise quality firm in terms of volume, I still think they're facing challenges because th th there's such a gap in that back office venue between retail platforms doing back office and risk internally and what you'd consider to be a, a, a back office at a prime broker like an FSS or a SunGuard. So I, I agree with you in general. I think retail has, a, has an interesting twist on it, especially when it comes down to their ability to warehouse the risk internally as well and not even rely on prime broker. Do we have time for one more? I promised Tom a question. That was a, a really interesting presentation, and I think you've got a really good take on, on the market and where it's going. Um, one thing you didn't cover that um, I am interested in and worried about as well is whether the regulators will start looking at what we do as technology providers and start wanting to get involved in what we do and effectively regulate us as a technology provider rather than a firm. I, I think that's an evolution that, that's relatively easy to compare to some other markets if you, if you look at equities and um, you look at what it means in, in the US at least to charge transactionally, you, you need to be a regulatory bod or regulated body. Um, I'd like to assume that it would be expensive. It would involve building out a compliance department, which is something that neither of us want to do. Um, I assume it would erode our margins, perhaps to the point that the model isn't viable anymore. Um, I think it would be a lot worse for the other 20 bridge providers out there who don't have the balance sheet, don't necessarily have the momentum to actually face those challenges. So um, honestly speaking, uh, that's something we talk about at 1-0. It's something we're aware of and, and on the lookout for. Um, I think it would be regional. I, I, I don't, you know, there's not going to be a worldwide regulation that says this. I think um, you'd see it similar to what you saw with net cap and, and the NFA regulations that came in and started to really restrict the brokers themselves. Um, you know, my question to the re regulator would be, who are you protecting, I guess, at the end of the day? I'd rather them come in and say, we don't want to get our hands in the pot, but we want to regulate things like auditing your ability to do asymmetrical slippage, something we've stayed away from for the entire time we've been in this industry. I want to regulate the ability to manipulate my book or manipulate my market in a way that is actually hurting people. So in, in some ways, we, we welcome that compliance and regulatory oversight. In other ways, it's, it's daunting from a cost and margin perspective and not unfeasible. But uh, I, I do think that's where providers with scale and those that have actually transcended, unfortunately, not the name bridge provider, but the, the, the technology that we're delivering, um, I, I, I think we're, we're suited to handle it. Thank you. No problem. Thank you, guys.